If you would like to have your Bibles open at the chapter that we read together earlier, you will most probably find that helpful. Nahum chapter 3 is what we will be looking at this afternoon, and I've entitled the sermon, The End of Nineveh, for that is what we have described before us. Last time we considered the city of Nineveh in its might, its fall, and its coming to silence. This afternoon, we arrive at the end of the city. We do so by considering what the city had become, the root of the evil, the question of the truth, the justice of God, and the comfort for the people of truth. And the chapter starts in the first three verses with the city described. This final chapter starts with an awful description of Nineveh. It is a city full of innocent blood, where innocent people have been killed, the city has blood on its hands. They lie regularly. Truth was absent in this city. Nothing could be relied upon. Robbery is also abundant in the city. As the leaders are fleecing those they rule over, those who are preyed upon cannot escape. The authorities chastise, the police and the army oppress the people, and many are slain in the streets. This reminds us very much of the Garden of Eden where the word of God was questioned by the created being, Satan, who decided to rebel against his maker. Mankind was approached and sold a threefold lie. Ye shall not die, ye shall be as gods and your eyes will be opened to obtain forbidden knowledge. Mankind listened and was brought down as death became the sentence upon both Adam, who was not deceived, and Eve, who was deceived for their disobedience and rebellion against their creator. It was all brought about by lies. Those spoken by Satan through the serpent, who promised so much and yet lied. They were promised life and received death. They were promised to rule like God and became slaves to Satan. They were promised forbidden knowledge and lost the access to the thanks of all knowledge. The result is found wherever the forces of evil are followed. There will be death, there will be deceit, and there will be oppression. It is no different in our own day. Where evil is followed, these things will be the result. And we see it in many places across the world today. This could so easily have been Babel. 
under Nimrod, or Egypt under Pharaoh, or any other mighty world empire of any age. They all act in the same way eventually. They all kill the vulnerable and innocents. They all tell lies. They all rob their people by whatever banking system they have. They all abuse their people. This was true here in Nineveh. And as Solomon says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing new under the sun. And we believe that to be true. So we have this awful description of the city at the very start of this third chapter. But then secondly, in the following verses, from verses four to seven, we see the root of the evil. The city arriving in this place, which happens to all great cities before they implode, is due to whoredom. Their being like a harlot. In the Bible, where we encounter talk about whores and whoredom and harlots, we should remember that this often relates to the worship of others rather than the Creator. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Moses was warned at the very start of the Bible that the people of God would go the same way. Following idols, following others rather than their God. The great whore of the earth at the time of this prophecy was Nineveh who fits perfectly the description in Revelation chapter 17 and the first five verses of that chapter, where we read, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore, that sitteth upon many waters or kingdoms, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-coloured beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The description of the scribes and the Pharisees of the first century AD a description of the corrupt church in our own generation and of a nation fallen from God is so true of many cities 
which headed empires in history, they all were similar. They worship the rebel from the garden, Satan himself. And this is where all false religion leads, inevitably into witchcraft. Weaker nations are purchased by evil cities through whoredom and deception. The weaker nations are offered what they lack, which is often food, if they will allow themselves to be plundered of their resources and corrupted by the city which sent them. The city of London is no different. It expanded this way as they went in, took the wealth of nations and left them impoverished and dependent upon the city. By doing this, they impoverished the nations by imposing their corrupt ways upon them. This is what is happening to us now as it returns on our head from a just God. But note the families in the nations are sold through witchcraft. If only churches had been awake back in the 1990s, when witchcraft was seeping into the schools in our nation using circle time for infants to break down authority in the classroom and the home. Followed by Harry Potter, and isn't it good to be a wizard, and a host of other influences, these things are in our schools. And this is how empires of wickedness destroy both nations and the families which are the bedrock of those nations. We can understand when we get to verse 5 that we read the Lord is against them. Listen to the Lord in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verses 17 to 22. Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. But thou shalt remember that thou wast the bondman in Egypt. And the Lord thy God redeemed thee thence. Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field and hast forgotten the sheaf in the field, that thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the works of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. You see, God tells his people to care for the stranger or the immigrant, the fatherless children, and the woman with no income. This is how any godly nation should function. And doing this means that you don't go about to seek to destroy other nations, but only to build them up, to work peaceably with them. And this is the opposite to what we see in the West today. 
where the destruction of everything appears to be the aim. The Lord speaks again to his people in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verses 9 to 12, where we read, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. You see, these things are to be avoided and destroyed, not being accepted in any form. The Lord is against them and will expose them and their lies will eventually be seen to be such. The truth will rise to the surface, and when it does, the liars will see, be seen to be fools. I know these things, as I once was a very bad liar who could not be trusted. It is very embarrassing when the truth comes out. And you've been shown to be foolish in your lives. But in our day, we need to be men and women of the truth. And if the source of a story is corrupt, we need to wait until real quantifiable evidence can be seen. When so many see the foolishness of following liars, all will flee from them. Verse 7. There will be none prepared to bemoan their demise, and there will be none there who want to go and comfort them because of all that they have done. But then thirdly, in verses 8 to 15, we have the question, are you great? The greatness of the Ninevites and the Assyrian Empire is then questioned, are they better than no? Now let me explain where no is. No was the large ancient capital of Upper Egypt called Thebes. Jeremiah mentions the punishment of that place in Jeremiah 46 and verse 25. Ezekiel also proclaims against it in chapter 30 and verses 14 to 16. And it was like Nineveh. It was built on a great river, only this time it was the Nile in Upper Egypt rather than the Tigris in Mesopotamia. It ruled over Ethiopia and Egypt, and Libya was in alliance with them. But that great city of No was destroyed by the Assyrians, who carried them into captivity and killed the youngsters. The great and honourable of No were to have lots cast over them to decide who would buy them. It was a great place, but it saw destruction. And the question here is asked of the Assyrians, are you any better than No? who they knew about. The 
The truth of the answer is no, that they are feeble. They will be drunk like those of no. They will seek safety because of their enemy, but they will not find any. Their strongholds are pictured like fig trees ready for harvest. And I don't know whether you know much about fig trees. But when the fruit is ripe, if you shake it, it falls. So they are described here like ripe fig trees. And if they're shaken, it says, the figs will fall into the mouths of the eaters. They will be useless and will not protect them. These strongholds that it's talking about. They'll be like the fig trees, shedding the fruit or the people into the hands of those that want them. Their people will be as feeble women, unable to descend, defend themselves from the powerful and mighty. Their gates would be opened wide. And we saw that last time, that the river did this in a large part, when a large part of the wall collapsed and the enemy was able to flood in. The bars of their gates would be destroyed by fire. And remember, the city was burnt after the king burnt his palace down upon himself to prevent capture. They are encouraged to prepare for the siege. He says, draw water. Fortify towers. Make brick and mortar. But they are also told that fire would destroy them and the sword. The fire and sword will be like a canker worm. Now, I don't know how much you know about moths. But the canker worm becomes a moth. And this worm destroys the tree on which it is hatched by feeding off all the spring foliage, and then it flies away and leaves the tree behind. An infestation of the canker worm can destroy a tree over a couple of years. And in this way, the fire and sword would destroy them and then move on and go away. So we have the question, are they great? But then fourthly, I want us to see the justice of God in verses 16 to 19. You see, they had lived as canker worms with their many businessmen and bankers, multiplying them as the stars of heaven. And these men had gone out and acted like canker worms plundering resources and then moving on, just like the canker worm. Those who rule over them, the kings, prime ministers, the crown of wealth and the captains or mighty military leaders. These men hide in the hedges in the trouble of the cold day but flee and can't be found in the heat of warfare. The shepherds who care for the people are asleep in the comfort that surrounds them. These noble shepherds will settle in the dust. The people are scattered on the mountains because of the calamity and disorder, and there is none for them to follow. As the Assyrians and Ninevites had done to others in the world, they were now to suffer those same things themselves. 
The Lord says regarding the wicked in Psalm 7 that we read at the start of the service, verses 14 to 16. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived mischief, and brought falsehood. He made a pit, and digged it, and is fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pates. The Lord says to his own people in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 8, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. They were warned not to sow iniquity like the heathen. The Lord speaks to the northern kingdom of Israel in Hosea, chapter 10 and verse 13. Ye have ploughed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. As God's people, we must not live in wickedness, but in righteousness, or the same result will fall upon us. This is just as we saw in Galatians 6 and verse 7 the other week. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And finally, this brings comfort to the Lord's people of truth. The fact of there being no healing for the monster of the evil state or empire is a comfort to those who are oppressed. And that often includes the people of God. They know, however tyrannical the city may be, there is an end of their terror when they will fall never to rise again. In its historical setting, the Assyrian Empire, headed by Nineveh, had come against the northern kingdom of Israel and wiped them out. They had also come against Judah and besieged Jerusalem, but failed in taking it. The Lord's people may suffer at the hand of these wicked tyrants, but they will never be overcome. Jesus speaking to Peter about his statement, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, says on this rock, that statement that Peter had said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell will challenge it. They will try to destroy it, but they will fail every time. And may the Lord be praised for the safekeeping of his people, both in the past and today and in the future. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the encouragement and the comfort that you give to your people in your word. And we pray that you will help us to go forward into tomorrow with that comfort in our hearts, that regardless of what we may encounter, Regardless of what we see going on around about us, we have a great God who rules in the heavens and will bring about justice. Father, we pray, praise 
and thank you for who you are and for the protection that you provide for your children. Amen.